On JC Direct this week, is there really value in Sasso? Strong Advertech update, CMH combined motor holdings breaking higher or fake break. Uh, Renogen finally gets some helium flowing, US CPI and Coronation listing active ETFs. Hello and welcome to JC Direct, episode 599, uh, and this, of course, for 15 August. My name is Simon Brown. I suppose let's start off straight away with Sassel. Two weeks ago, we had the trading update from Sassel, sorry, production update from Sassel, and it was... It, it was not bad. And I remember I chatted with Amira Pick from uh, Old Mutual Investment Managers around that. Uh, and, and she made the point that what they can manage, and there's a lot they can't, is doing well. I mean, they can't manage some of the issues around uh, pricing and the like. But, for example, the gas from Mozambique was online uh, under budget and early. So I spoke about that a couple of weeks ago. And then this week, we got ourselves a trading update from Sasso. And uh, short answer, it was a horror. An absolute horror. Now, let, let, let's delve into why and what and how and all of that. In essence, they're being squeezed by pricing, uh, and that pricing most notably is in the chemical complex. They've had to write down some 50-odd billion of assets. Now, write-downs, talked about it before, they will stress to you it's non-cash. They are correct. It's not cash here. But it's on the balance sheet because it was cash back in the day when they built the plant or whatever it was that they've done. And now, of course, they've got to write it down. So it was once upon a time cash. But it even includes a write down on, for example, Secunda. And what they're doing with the write downs is they're basically saying the returns that we're going to make from these assets, the profits, the cash flow we're going to make from these assets is going to be lower than anticipated. Therefore, we have to write down the value. Now, this is accounting trickery, right? In the sense of, well, it's going to be lower. Like, sorry, guys, then that's your problem. Uh, you know, carry on. But you write it down because it helps with your return and equity uh, and bonuses and all of those sort of things at the same time. Uh, lots of write downs. They also had a, a tax charge back or something of another 10 odd billion. All in all, it's about 70 billion. They're going to record a loss. There is no dividend coming. Is there value there? So the forward PE was three. If we take the mid of that range from the trading update, we get to about 3.3 .3 times PE. So I think maybe that update was a little worse than expected by many. Uh, my fair shout on it. If we look at things, for example, price to book in SAS was 0 0.4. Now that gets slashed, right? Because they, they're writing things down. So they're slashing that, 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 that book. Uh, but the, the, the mean is 1.1. The mean PE is 15.4. It goes to three times. Here's my thinking with Sassel. I mean, is there value in Sassel? Sure. I, I think we can all agree that there's some value in Sassel. The problem is, quite simply, is how much value and what are upside targets. We have looked at this before. There are three holds, three buys, and two strong buys. Uh, the, the upside target is 260. We had Morgan Stanley upgrade, up, upgrade them to 250 uh, this, this last week. Yesterday, we had Citigroup upgrade them to 220. I haven't checked, but Standard Bank had a 550. Uh, the upside price target's 260. The average is 202. Let's call it the lows, 142. And Sassel is 128 at Tuesday's close. On the surface, this says to you, cheapest stock that you can possibly find. Okay, except for the small problem, which is, well, the market is not buying that. And how do we know that? Well, because the stock isn't running higher. Uh, it's, it's just that simple. So if we look at a weekly chart, and I'm going to take that off. I've liked it, but I don't think we need it. Yep, there we go. Let's remove that. I want to put a new box in here. I mean, what we can see is a, a trading-ish within a range, 150 at the top, 120 at the bottom. Right now, it does look like 120 is where it's heading to. Uh, let's quickly go over here. What is Sassel currently? So it's bounced today. It's trading at 130 today, which is looking a little bit better. Today as in uh, half past three Wednesday afternoon as I am recording. But my argument is quite simple. And I've said this before more than once or twice, which is why? Why buy a falling stock? This is a multi-year chart of Sasol. Uh, let's go back to its April 22. Uh, back then it was trading at about 405. And it's just basically been falling. If there is value here, 
at some point it bottoms and it starts to run higher. Now, I mean, how great to buy it at 120 or 130 and then watch it go to that plus 200. Sure, absolutely it is. But how long do you wait and how much lower does it go? And Why not wait for it to start moving higher? And that's always been what I say to folks is wait for it to be moving higher. You like the share, excellent. Everything says you should be holding it but it's falling, which means the market disagrees with you. And in order for you to make money, you need the market to now start agreeing with your idea. You need a majority of the market to be buyers and not sellers. Falling share price tells you that the majority are sellers. And if you think it's a great buy, it means the majority is against you. You can't beat the majority in this case. You never can. So wait for the majority to get on your side. And then ride in the bus. And if this is a two, three, 550 rand stock, you know, if you only get in at, I don't know, where do you buy? 150 or maybe you buy 170. I don't know where. You, you, you pick a, a methodology, methodology to determine the turn here. But don't keep on buying the, 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 the falling stock. Wait for the market to agree with you because everyone says it's value. My Twitter is chock full of people saying Sasso is value, except for the part that it keeps on falling. And that, to me, is the part that perhaps matters most. So we have some uh, events next week. Thursday, uh, it is the 22nd of August. And it's with Mishima Gama. We're doing charting. Uh, I've spoken about this a bunch. Uh, she is the chart expert. She will come and help us understand the what's, where's, and how's. You can book at just one lap.com slash events. It is 22nd, which is next Thursday, 5.30, webcast or in person at the Standard Bank head office in Baker Street, Rosebank, Johannesburg. Always lacquer if you can come along. But if you can't, you can make the webcast. And if you can't make the webcast, we do, as always, record. So U.S. inflation came out uh, earlier this Wednesday afternoon, 2.9% uh, for July. It had been 3% the month before, and that was a, uh, a surprise. 3% was better than what the market had been expecting. Cornflation elevated, 3.2. Uh, shelter inflation, 5.1. They do shelter inflation weirdly it, 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 because, you know, what leases are like a year long. And how do you determine shelter inflation in a red-hot property market, et cetera, et cetera? So short answer. Is, it's taking a long time to get to the 2% target. That's not a surprise. I spent uh, uh, all of uh, 2022 saying you know, inflation will come down and initially it will be easy, and it was, and then it starts to get really hard, and it absolutely has. So now we're into the, the hard part of it. I still think we'll see uh, Jerome Powell and his team uh, cut their rates in September. The market is pricing in a 50 basis point cut. I know it might be a little aggressive, but we'll get that in September. The U.S. will, and then we'll get our own MPC, which is the day after uh, the September meet in the U.S., and I think we'll get a rate cut there as well. So I think we're still on track for that. Advertech, a stock that I hold. So let's get that disclaimer out of the way up front. Uh, education, of course, we all know what that stock is. And uh, a, a nice trading update. We're in that part of the market now where we're getting the trading updates. And then, of course, you know the June uh, period end trading updates. And then we'll start getting the, the, the rest of the data, the results all coming through. Uh, this is a voluntary because it's not a 20% variance. It is for six months. They say basic earnings. What am I looking for here? Uh, basic earnings per share. Uh, there we go. Basic uh, headline earnings per share, 13 to 18 percent higher between 95.3 and 99.5. If we take the top end, just because it makes math easier and say that was it's a rand, they're going to earn a buck in the first half of the year, double it for the year. They're going to earn two rand for the year. They're on a 30 rand and 80 cents share price up another, up another 2.6 today. That puts them on a P.E. of a smidgen over 15 times. That's not massively expensive, I don't think, by any stretch. And this has been, and this was the stocks, I've held it for an age. And, and weirdly, it peaked in, what was that? Uh, peaked in April of 2017. Uh, at uh, price there is 21 rand. Went all the way down to almost five bucks in the pandemic. Had a big consolidation in 2022, but is actually looking quite good at this point in time. The Others in the space, there's Stadio, there's Cura. I mean, there's, we've actually got a good selection here of stocks, and, and that I think is quite important. 
point being is I think you've got to kind of pick one. And, and my pick one that I like is Advertech. But there's you know, certainly a compelling case for others. Uh, so Forward PE, they're actually saying it's a 12 on here, uh, which puts us down. The, the mean PE is closer to 18 and change. And if we look, oh no, so that Forward PE is way historic. That's going back to 2021. They don't have any analysts here. Uh, and the price to book is 3 minus 2.6. If you look at 2017 when it peaked, uh, PE was up at around 30. So it's technically about half the valuation, although it is, you know, the price is markedly higher. I like the stock. I think it's uh, offering good opportunity here. Uh, and, and make no mistake, it has run, but I don't think it is expensive. CMH is an interesting one. I hold this one too, Combined Motor Holdings. This stock has basically been, let's say, going sideways since August of 2021 three years. I, I'd bought it a little bit before. I'm actually in a profit here at 30, 30 round 50. I'm in it around 26 round. Uh, dividend yield here is significantly chunky. And that really is the interesting thing with CMH. The, the price earnings is five and change. Let's go call it up on my, uh, call it up on the, the, uh, Quifin. Sorry, my name. C couldn't remember what that was called. Um, so yeah, that's for some reason. Okay, that, that's that's the forward PE. The long term PE is the PE is five point six. The mean is seven point four. Price to book is one point seven. This is a cheap stock. It absolutely is a cheap stock. And it comes back to I've held it forever because I'm earning some fifteen percent. What is the dividend yield? Okay, it's now twelve because the stock is up some ten odd percent. But it's paying a really chunky dividend yield. So I'm getting 12% a year. On my base price, I'm getting closer to 17, 18% a year. My base price. And it was what I paid for it, not what I could sell it for today. And again, the consumer. I've spoken about it a ton. I mean, you know, the, the money coming from two pot, the money coming from reduced rates, the money coming from in lower inflation, the money come from no more load shedding, or at least not for 100 plus days at this point. CMH, and we've got a lot of old cars on the road. So they certainly are, I think, well positioned in this point as well. And I, I, I like the stock. I mean, there is Zeta, not the car company. Um, and I like them, but the price action isn't interesting at this point. And then there's Motors, and I've preferred CMH over Motors for pretty much ever and a day. And then there's Renogen. Yeah, okay, so I hold that one too. So Renogen has been a story. I don't think I need to go back to explain it to you all. But on Friday morning, which was a public holiday in South Africa, there was a sense announcement in Australia, which basically said, we are finally producing helium. Yo, yo, yo. Uh, a year and a half late from the delayed plans. I mean, this is this is late. This is very, very late. Um, they are finally producing helium. Remember, they had leaks and all of that sort of stuff. So now they had to go back and get their helium going. That saw the stock uh, on Monday when we opened. I think it was up some 20%. It's having a decent week again. It is still... I mean, let me pull up that price. I mean, it, it, it is still a uh, depressed stock if you bought it at the wrong point. I'm underwater on it. Um, I can't remember exactly where I purchased, but I, I am underwater. Let's be clear about that. But it is important. That, you know, that's a terrible, terrible chart. Yeah. So it was, what, 45? And, and yes, it's now up to 11.65, but it was down at 8 bucks 40. They are producing the helium. Is that the end of the story? Well, no. They've got to get the helium into a tanker. They've got to then go and sell that. Now they can say, okay, things are good. And then they've got to do it again and again and again and sell however many tankers of helium per year for phase one. And that's still not the journey over. They've got to do a NASDAQ listing to raise all that money. And then they've got to start phase two. And phase one, I mean, so phase two, way back in the day, was a 2024 start date. Here we are. Phase one is only just going. There is still a long way to go. I'm going to be writing a piece for Financial Mail. It will be in next week's Financial Mail sentiment sentiment in junior miners uh, and, and, and how that can turn in a dime and how when the sentiment gets bleak, man, it is tough out there. It's just not easy to come back from that. And that's exactly where we see uh, uh, Renogen at this point. They've got to really go above and beyond and, and fundamentally prove themselves to get the market back on their side. Coronation is launching active ETFs. You can find more just onelap.com slash ETFs. There are six of them, actively managed ETFs. This is a new product. So we know ETFs on the JSC, but they're passive. They track an index or a basket, whatever the case is. Active ones are basically unit trust in an ETF on the JSC. Uh, they're going with it. Why are they doing it? Distribution. 
So coronation, you know, if you, there was a period if you went through Cape Town International Airport, there was just coronation advertising signs everywhere, billboards. You know, and they've got their, 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 their financial advisors out there. They're on all the different lists and the like. Uh, but now they're on the JSC, which means you know all of those million-plus easy equity account holders and all the other folks with private uh, brokerage accounts can now go click, click, and buy some coronation. No advisor fees, none of that. The active part, the first one that they listed, which was uh, today, 14th of August, well, you'll be listening tomorrow, but today, is, uh, and the names are horrendous, the Global Strategy USD Income Prescient Feeder Actively Managed ETF. Okay, nonetheless, part of luck, USD Income. So what they're looking at is essentially to get an income earning uh, ET, actively managed ETF, but earning dollar income, and then, of course, paying out in ZAR. Uh, they've got two coming next week, which is a moderate global allocation, a global equity, and then three more, conservative global, aggressive global, and emerging market. I like it. I, I'm probably not going to buy any of them, but uh, it is you know, a choice. I like choice. Even if I don't want to buy it, I like the fact that there is choice because somebody else will probably want to buy it. And it's good for the JC. So quickly go down that rabbit hole. The JC is in the exchange, had some results last week. They weren't bad. They weren't killer. But if we start seeing some increased volumes coming through and we've got the coronation, actively managed ETFs and a whole bunch of others coming, uh, things start to get interesting at the JC in terms of their, their trading volumes and the profit they make from it. Now, they're making a lot of money in other areas now as they've de-risked, but certainly uh, it, it's interesting and I think it's uh, absolutely noteworthy. And then on a on a sad note, uh, Brett Duncan, many of you probably don't know Brett Duncan. Uh, he passed away earlier in the week. He was younger than me, which is always just, uh, truthfully, uh, yeah, it's all the things you think it is, right? It, it, it's scary. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's just horrible. But he was my first stock guy. He was my first stockbroker who took my phone calls. So I got a stockbroker in 1987. Um, I was in matric. I had 120 rand. I wanted to buy some, 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 some computer shares. I got die data at that point. But, of course, no stockbroker would open me an account. And so my grandfather wangled a deal with his stockbroker, uh, and they opened me an account. I didn't realize that my grandfather was paying my transaction fee when I purchased because the transaction fees were way more than the 120 rand I have. And then my grandfather passed away, I think it was 1994, 95. He it must have been 94 because he was 96 years old. Um, and he was born in 1898. And he passed away, and that broker didn't want anything to do with me. They stopped taking my calls, and I would write letters and stuff. And it was just messy. And then eventually I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get myself my own broker. And I went to this company, Martindale, Stacy, and Detoy. I don't know how or why I chose them. And I was given, uh, uh, told that Kuku and this will be your broker. And it was the young new kid that they just recently employed. His name was Brett Duncan. So I've known Brett for close on 30 years. He then joined uh, uh, Trade Deck and then he joined Standard Bank in 2002, headed up their warrants desk. And you've got to understand, Standard Bank owned the warrants space. Maybe he joined Standard Bank in 2000. I can't quite remember the dates. But he, I mean, Standard Bank, I mean, in the warrants market, and it was highly competitive. There was EBSA, there was Gensec, there was Deutsche Bank, there was UBS uh, for a while, there was Standard Bank, there were all these other folks doing it. Uh, EBSA was in there, Investec was in there, and Standard Bank probably had more than 50% market share. Uh, it was Naveen Naker, it was uh, Grant Mankies, it was uh, Richard uh, Yuknovich, Richard Hirsch, and Brett Duncan was the boss. And he absolutely... They owned the Warren space. And then I joined, of course, Standard Bank. I, I'd known Brett because I ran a website called SA Warrants. He'd been my broker, and then, of course, I knew him then. Uh, and then I'd, uh, I joined uh, uh, Standard Online Share Trading in 2007, left in 2010. Around 2012, 2013, he took that over as well under his ambit, and then he left Standard Bank some about two years ago or so. Um, as I say, most of you probably don't know Brett Duncan. If you did, it is it is tragic. He passed on Monday. Uh, it was a heart attack. Um, and, and there are there are there are no words. My heart goes out to his family. It, it is it is just it is horrible to the nth degree. There is no way to 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 otherwise explain it. JC is a registered trademark of the JC Limited. JC Direct is an independent broadcast and is not endorsed or affiliated with, nor has it been authorized or otherwise approved by JC Limited. The views expressed in this program are solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views of JC Limited.
Yeah, they are my views, and of course they are just that, they are views. But we'll leave it there today. Uh, next Thursday, we'll see you at the Power Hour, 5.30. Uh, otherwise, my name is Simon. Until then, look after yourself, and if you can, as always, look after somebody else as well.